Hey guys, how you doing? It's Henry and Mowers and Blowers! Good morning. Uh, pretty decent day today. It's gonna be like 38, you know? So, uh, as you can see, a lot of that 16 inches of snow we got uh, a week or so ago started to melt big time. So you can see the lawn now, the streets are clear or whatever, and uh, well, there's no snow in the horizon. So hey, no matter what, I'm very stoked about the snowstorm because I was able to try out all three of the snow blowers that I had in my inventory. I didn't get to bring out my uh, 1333 Monster Beast because I've had the errands to you know, to use. So uh, I probably won't be using it. I've had a bunch of offers from my errands, the 1128, and I've gotten as much as uh, $800. But do you guys think $800 is gonna do it? I have it listed for 1275. I know 1275 is kind of a reach, but I wanna get at least, I wanna say like 1200 for it, because I like that thing so much, I like it better than my beast. I think I might sell my beast. But anyway, the Honda worked great, and the Craftsman, it's what it is. It's a Craftsman single stage. It doesn't really throw snow very well, but uh, it'll work for some people with small driveways, you know? So anyway, that's all, all I have. And uh, the Life Lead, the electric one that I had. You guys remember this from last year? This thing for a single stage, fully electric uh, snowblower actually does powder extremely well. It throws it very far. Further than the Craftsman single stage gas one that I have. So that's all I have right now in terms of uh, snow blowers. Only the, the shitty Craftsman. This Honda HS520 is absolutely fantastic. This Aaron's of course, which I love. And I think I might keep because it has the heated grips. It's the only one I have with heated grips. Only only heated grip snow blower I've ever had. Uh, anyway, so I, tr I tried the battery in here a few times. And it wouldn't work. It wouldn't charge. I tried it two, three times. And then finally on the third time, on the third time uh, of charging this through a cycle, finally, if you look at the meter, full, four bars. So, um, I, well, I thought this was going to be a useless piece of junk, a brick, if the battery didn't work. I'm certainly not going to spend $50 for a new battery. So now this thing's good to go too. So I have four snow blowers, of which I'm gonna keep these two. Uh, I'm thinking about keeping that Honda too, but I, and you know, I can't keep everything. So I'm gonna try to sell some of those, but I'm completely out of snow blowers to uh, fix. So in the interim, I'm gonna go to my backyard and uh, whip out something that I could start fixing as a project. Still have about a month, about a month to go uh, for until spring gets here. A couple of months actually, and I've got a ton of uh, lawn mowers, three lawn tractors I have to fix. Like I said, lots of lawn mowers, and I know that as it gets warmer, I'm going to be picking up even more things. So I want to try to put a dent into some of the stuff that I still have yet to fix, which are these things out here. Uh, but what sticks out to me is this thing. This is a Craftsman Tiller. Uh, some people call it Roto Tiller. Roto meaning rotation, right? Usually a small handheld tiller. It's just like a claw. You could till the gra ground. Motorized one that rotates is a Roto Tiller. The only other rototiller I've ever had, I believe, is a Ryobi that I fixed and sold uh, for about 150 bucks, and that was a small one. This one is in very good condition, with the exception of surface rust along the uh, tines. Tines, I guess you want to call it. I don't believe these are bent out of shape. I think they're just bent that way on purpose, you know? Because the bend is consistent with the other side. So I'm thinking that it, the blades are supposed to be bent that way. You know what I mean by consistent? They're, it's exactly the same bend on the other side. So I know that the uh, tines are good. With the exception of some 
uh, dried grass and uh, roots that are stuck along the uh, rotating shaft. This is the older Craftsman uh, Briggs & Stratton 5.5 horsepower engine. Uh, I'm not looking forward to it. Why? Because the gas tanks in this is metal and it's usually always rusted on the in inside. Plus the carburetor is somewhat of a uh, pulsa jet type um, carburetor where there's a the sucking straw goes all the way down here and sucks up the fuel up there kind of like uh, those push mowers you know but it's a pain in the ass to work on because there's diaphragms in it and also the linkage is kind of tricky because it goes from here all the way to the bottom too and to remove all this stuff is kind of a pain in the butt uh, what you notice here is that uh, there's no pull rope pull rope is sitting right there <laughs> so what I'm thinking is that this is a good condition rototiller a big one you know what I mean this is a big rototiller not the biggest but it's pretty big I'm thinking the guy was using it or wanted to use it and uh, it was running just fine before because like you can see it's in good shape like probably uh, hardly used too much and that the pull rope came out and he stopped using it and threw it out so if you just fix the pull rope hopefully everything should be good uh, to fix this pull rope as you can see the uh, recoil starter is riveted onto the engine cover you have to remove the entire engine cover to get the pull rope back in here we're gonna do that today First, I got a letter here from, hey Henry, I just wanted to start off by saying thank you for the hard work you put into having such an awesome channel. I know it's a ton of work. Uh, I've watched your channel for a couple of years now, but recently started commenting after starting my own channel. I realized how important the comments and thumbs up are. I wanted to send you some stickers and Roger McDonald helped me get a way to send them to you. Have a great one and keep up the awesome channel. Alex Hickey from Freedom Mowers. Uh, you know, that, that's really cool because uh, I've inspired uh, a bunch of people to start their own channel because honestly, if you do this kind of thing every day, right, you got tons of content. A lot of companies pay a ton of money for content. Since you're doing the content, you might as well put a camera to it. Even if you don't narrate it or do anything about it, just upload what you're doing. You know what I mean? People out there in America or wherever the entire world would like to know what you're doing. Some people need to fix a certain item and they can't fix it. They'd like to have a resource where they could find somebody who's fixing the exact thing they are. And if they're not mechanically inclined, they'll be able to fix it on their own. Help your fellow man fix your shit for free you know what I mean anyway he sent me a couple of his stickers go check them out on YouTube freedom mowers uh, I hope that uh, people will take an example like this and if you do wrench on things just put a camera to it it'll get better and easier as you go some of you guys have been watching my very very old videos from three four years ago <laughs> and you make leaps and bounds from those first videos my videos now are far better than the first one, obviously, you know. You learn uh, as you go. I'm going to stick this on. Blowers and Blowers, Wall of Fame. Now, since you got my address from Roger McDonald, now you guys know you can get my address from buying one of my stickers. As you guys saw, I have some new stickers out, and I'll put you right next to, right on top of Roger's Mowers. Uh, from a marketing standpoint, you want to try to get the entire sticker in the circle, you know, because you have this space with the two uh, white things. So basically, you'd have to just zoom in so that this flag fills the circle. <laughs> just a little marketing advice is all. Uh, anyway, uh, I've sold like uh, 15 of my new stickers already. I got 35 left, limited edition. Get yours. Support the channel. Buy a sticker. Thanks, Alex. Just looking at the um, engine cover that has the recoil starter re uh, riveted on here, you can see that there are one, two, three, four, um, looks like three eighths or 10 millimeter. 
So I only brought out my uh, impact with the 3 8 on it. <laughs> Hopefully I wouldn't have to go back and forth to my garage to get tools. Otherwise I have to roll out the little tool cart. Uh, speaking of the stickers, shout out to John Conti from uh, Addison, Illinois. Uh, Anthony De Jesus, and it's not De Jesus, it's Anthony De Jesus from Vineland, New Jersey. And also my good friend Mike and Savannah Pelzik from Milwaukee, Wisconsin for buying those 15 stickers. Well, uh, I've had three other people that have bought those stickers. Those shout outs already went out. Um, remember, when you buy a sticker, if you have a business or a YouTube channel, you know that I'm gonna shout you out. Isn't that worth the price of a sticker? Also, it supports the channel. I'm gonna try this. Using one hand to hold the camera, other hand to get you guys to actually see the entire experience and know exactly what to do to get this thing off. It would suck if they hid one in there, you know what I mean, where you'd have to remove the gas tank just to get to it. But it looks like it's, oh, son of a gun, there it is. Yeah, all right, so four. Will this just come out with one hand? That's right, I've only used one hand and an impact. Will this come out? <laughs> Awesome. That was easy. So recoil starters are, are easy to fix. I know it seems a little intimidating if somebody has never done it before, but it's pretty easy. I sure hope that's not a points magneto because that would suck. See what I mean about this? There's uh, all kinds of linkages that go all the way to the bottom. See, uh, I'm going to put the camera here and I'm going to I'm going to go squeeze that lever on the handle just to make sure that it works. Let's see. Does it move? I can't see from here. Is it moving? I don't see it moving. That's not good if it's not moving. What if I move these things? Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, that's the choke, I believe. This is the throttle. I'm turning the thing. I'm, I'm squeezing the handle and nothing's moving. You know what? I think squeezing this uh, cable here to the lever, I think that just engages the belt, you know, kind of like a snowblower. It engages a pulley that tightens the belt that turns the tines or blades to the rototiller. I think that's what it is. All right, so uh, let's see if this rope is long enough. What you want to do is you want to just take this rope and see if it's at least arm's length. You know, the motion of you pulling, it's got to be about that long, you know? Uh, also, you look at the condition of the rope. Is it worth putting the same rope back in there if it broke the first time? There's got to be a reason why it broke the first time, right? That it might be weak or frayed or there's a kink in it or something or a knot that you can't get out. Believe me, I, I've seen a knot. Why would there be a knot? Well, because you pull it so hard, it recoils, wraps around, whatever. The guy goes through the hole here. He's not noticing it. He pulls it super hard. There you go. Got a tight knot. And you'll never be able to get it out. So look, if it's over there and you're pulling it, this is, this is more than long enough, you know? So I think that's okay. So I have to go to the garage to get three things. Side cutters, flathead screwdriver or stick, whatever, and a lighter, I'll show you. So I've deemed this cord to be long enough and I've inspected it to make sure that there's no fraying or cuts in it that you wouldn't use the rope, but the rope looks okay. As you can see, that part here is frayed. So you wanna make sure that this is gonna be easy to get into a hole it being puffed out like that and frayed, it's not gonna work. Also, it's wet, but you should be able to get that in there. You know what I mean? I know you know what I mean. Uh, we'll see. Recoil starter on the inside. It's got some spits in it. Oh, actually, you know what? This is the leftover, this is the leftover fraying of the rope that's in here. As you can see, a knot is right there. So I'm gonna use these side cutters, pull out 
the frayed part. This is the remnants of it. So you know that this is where it uh, broke. So that rope is almost full length with the exception of these two inches here, see? So that's good enough. We know that rope is definitely almost uh, stock length. Now before we get going here, I wanted to uh, first show you. So these things are called the pawls, all right? When you rotate this, uh, this thing here, as you pull the rope, this thing moves and the pawls will stick out. When they stick out, they grip onto the metal cup there and it turns the flywheel. You want to make sure that this moves and the pawls come out and retract, which they do, see? You always wind it counterclockwise. Clockwise is like a clock, this way. You do it counterclockwise where you feel tension. You do it all the way until you can't move it anymore, until you feel like you're gonna break the recoil. You wanna match up the part where the knot was here, right, the hole. You wanna match it up to the exiting hole right there, to the recoil starter. Okay, I got you over here. I'm just gonna do it real time. If it wasn't so darn cold, my hands wouldn't be freezing. It's, I mean, 38 is still cold, you know what I mean? So, I'm just gonna wind it until I can't wind it anymore. It would be easier if I could grip it with my hand, but it's cold. There we go. Can you guys see? I know, it's tough to make videos and do things without your hands in a way. But you have to because you can't do it without your hands here. I'm turning it. Ooh, I feel, I feel tension. Big tension. And I don't want to push it any more than this. Alright, that, that, that's really hard already. So I'm going to find the hole right there. I'm going to try to pull it all the way over here to see if it'll at least go there. And it does. Could I, could I do another rotation? Oh, I'm pushing things. Oh, wow, could I do another rotation without breaking the coil? Should I risk it? It's a slippery slope. I did do another. That's it. I'm not pushing it anymore. So look, I'm holding it there. I'm going to stick a screwdriver to right around where the uh, output hole and the input hole meet. To kind of like hold it there know what I mean I know you know what I mean anyway just hold it like that so it won't uh, go back out again you can burn the end of this to make it easier to get through the hole but it looks like it's holding in place just gonna try to weasel this rope it's not very stiff it's kind of sloppy so it's gonna be kind of tough to do without like some needle nose pliers or something yeah, it looks like a, it's so floppy, I want to try to burn it because the uh, coating to this uh, rope has some kind of plastic on it or something, so. It's windy and wet. Let me go in the garage and do so this. This thing is saturated with water, it wouldn't burn, so this will have to do. But I did get some, when I was in the garage, I did get some needle nose, so I can try to at least vertically put it in here like that I'm trying to show you guys without um, putting my hand there too see how it's fraying now I have to burn that end otherwise it's not gonna work so uh, the rope is just soggy of water so that didn't work I'm putting some electrical tape on the tip here twisting it so that it's sharp you know like a needle and I was putting it in through the rear but that's assuming that I didn't already have <laughs> a handle on it so since we have the handle on it already let's just stick it through this side line it up there we go I see it grip it without pulling the tape out there we go now we got the rope through here rip the tape off make a canot and I know the K is silent, but why do you even put it there then if it's, I guess it's to identify the difference between I'm not going to school or tying the knot. 
but I'll just uh, differentiate that by saying I'm making a cannot. There we go. So then uh, you pull it, and there we go. It stopped, right? The knot is the knot is big enough that it won't go through. Take the screwdriver out. Let it recoil itself all the way through slowly, so that it doesn't overlap each other. The rope, I mean. There we go. Now our rope has been re-strung. It's a little stiff, so I'm going to get some penetrating oil and spray it. Oh, it's so cold, it's frozen. See? Anyway, I'm just going to spray all in there and all in there. Got this Bow Shield T9. Rust and corrosion protection and waterproof lubricant. That's exactly what we need. Let's extend the paws. Spray in between there. Sometimes there's like these little tiny springs or wire to under tension that could use some lubricant. So there we go. See? So it's retracted, right? Then you pull the rope and it brings out the paws which grip the cup. When you're, when you're done pulling it, you let go and it automatically goes back in again. That's how it all works. Uh, still a little stiff, so it's making a little bit of friction between the recoil starter grill, if you will. Just let some flow in there so that it doesn't rub or rub as little as possible. When you move it around, it'll spread, and that, that's much smoother right there. See? How easy was that to just put the rope back in, you know? Easy. So now I'm just gonna put this back again. So we uh, put the engine cover on, got the pull rope worked out, just give it a couple of pulls to see if it rotates, and it does, and you can feel that there's compression too, smooth, pretty smooth. That's right, I drop my phone on a regular basis. Uh, let's check out the gassage. <laughs> I'm afraid to even look. I know it's filled with rust. I know it. It's full of gas. And it's... It's like... I can feel like... A half inch of rust buildup in here. This is no good, fellas. No good. It's a lot of rust in there. Just imagine... I want to say a half inch of just rust buildup, you know, in here. No good. May not be worth fixing, honestly. It's like varnish in here, fellas. Tell by looking just at the cap. So there's varnish in here, a lot of rust. It's not going to start for sure. No way. It's for shits and giggles though. The we'll pull started a few times and there's no well it's not gonna it's not gonna because because it's probably blocked and clogged with rust and stuff. Carburetors trash, whatever, you know. It's not gonna start for sure. Not just from pulling it. Because if it was clear, just pulling it will draw fuel to the carburetor 
from the diaphragm system, whatever, and the way the pulse pulse jet works, has a vacuum when you pull it, piston pulls down, creates a vacuum in the line, sucks a little bit of gas to the carburetor through the diaphragm, and that's how you prime it, right? That's why there's no primer. Uh, as long as it's on choke, creates that vacuum. But now, being that the evidence shows that there's probably a ton of rust there, it's completely clogged. Everything in the carburetor is filled with rust and corrosion, gum, all that stuff. It's not gonna, it's not gonna start no matter how many times you pull it. So, just to see, let's spray some go-go juice in the carburetor by removing the air cleaner cover. Spray some go-go juice in here. There's the air filter cover. Has a decent looking, I mean you've seen worse, right? Decent looking air cleaner. And it's you know it's relatively clean. See some gas or exhaust there where the hole is, see. I'm gonna spray some 50% ether. Sure start. It's a new product from my friends over at Lucas Oil Products. It's like starting fluid. Remember, we don't know how long this has been like that. Uh-huh. So look, we're putting it on choke, right? But the flap is seized. You have to use your hand to close the choke. So another reason why it wouldn't start because the choke wasn't on. Ooh, you heard that? A spark. So we have spark. Hey, all right. So, I mean, it runs with the carb spray through it, you know? Do you know what it's gonna take <laughs> to get this going? Removal of this entire assembly, gas tank most important, right? Gotta take the gas tank off and grind the inside of it so that there's no more uh, rust. Then to take the carburetor completely apart with the linkages and stuff, clean it, probably replace it to be honest with you. And then, uh, You'd be good. Do I want to do that? I don't think I do. So I'll be thinking about whether or not I want to go through that kind of work for this or just sell this locally for like, as is, for like uh, 50 bucks. You know what I mean? Probably get 200 for it in the spring where somebody needs to till their yard or something you know but uh or i mean you could just put another engine on here but you'd have to see if the pulleys and the shaft and all that stuff line up with the holes and all you know so i don't know if i would want to do it i guess you have to find out what i decide to do in my next episode uh today's episode was how to repair your broken pull rope on a craftsman 5.5 horsepower Roto Tiller. See you guys next time on Mowers and Blowers. Hey, I'm Andy from Jericho. See, See you, you guys, guys next, next time, time on Mowers, Mowers and Blowers. Blowers. Hey, if you guys enjoyed the video, remember to give me a like. Also, comment below. Subscribe. Remember, it doesn't cost anything to subscribe. It's free, right? Also, hit that little bell. That way you'll get post notifications whenever there's a new video and you won't miss out on any of them. Remember to follow my Instagram and Facebook, as well as if you'd like to donate a dollar or two, paypal.me slash mowersandblowers. Really appreciate all the support. Also, to keep the videos coming every day, support the channel. Bye.